In this video, we're going to be starting off our chapter 14 on stress and health. Now, this is a pretty interesting chapter and a very relevant one because when we're looking at sources of stress and how people react to stress, it's something that everyone can relate to. So we're going to start talking sort of big picture stuff as usual, talk about sources of stress, what do we mean by stress, some of our base definitions. Then we're going to get into our reactions to stress. So what happens when we encounter those stressful situations? What do our bodies do? What are some of our emotional reactions? Things like that. Then we're going to look at strategies for managing stress. What are some of the ways that we can cope? We might also look a little bit at healthy versus unhealthy coping mechanisms. And then at the end, we're going to get into health psychology and some of the practices um, in terms of sort of psychological approaches uh, that we can often see when looking at psych in general. But to start with our sources of stress, that'll be this section here. We're going to talk about what is it that makes us feel stress. So step one, what is our definition of stress? And you're going to find that stress is a term that can be defined in a couple of different ways, depending on where you're looking. So for us, we're going to say that stress is our physical and psychological reaction to both internal and external stressors. Now, I don't love using a definition that's kind of the same as the original term we're trying to define within it, but this is one of those topics where you end up with some pretty reciprocal definitions. But let's go into what are internal and external stressors. These are just things, stimuli and events, that are going to represent some perceived, uh, perceived potential for harm, loss, damage, challenge, or some other threat to well-being. And that's a very broad definition because we're saying that anything that leads us to think that there's maybe some form of danger, whether that's physical danger or emotional danger, all of that is going to count as a stressor. And we can think of our stressors as things that are going to push us away from sort of our physiological and psychological balance. So we'll talk a lot about the term homeostasis in this chapter which is just talking about our internal balance state. So when you are calm and relaxed, you are usually in balance for some things at least. And when we're stressed, when we encounter these stressors, we're going to have things pushed out of balance. And when we get into our psychological reactions and we start looking at our internal autonomic nervous system processes, we can actually see that balance shifting. Um, but just sort of think of it for now as being pushed outside of our normal balance state. And so those stress responses are looking at the responses we have. And I'm continuing to keep it sort of separate with our uh, psychological and physical or biological responses. So in each of these, we're talking about physical and psychological in some way, shape, or form, because we're going to have sort of measurable biological reactions but we're also going to have, say, internal thought processes that would need to be considered. You're going to think differently when you're stressed than when you're not stressed. And we can also look at external reactions as well, because our behavior will change when we're stressed. So we're going to keep all of those in mind. So these are meant to be sort of broad terms right now, and we'll break it down and look at sort of internal emotional responses, including some cognitive stuff. We'll look at our physiological responses, biological reactions, and then we'll also look at behavioral reactions too. So there's all sorts of aspects to consider here. But those responses are going to include the internal and external ways that we're going to react or respond to the stressors in our environment. And our stress responses are supposed to be working to try and restore a balanced state. We got nudged out of our normal balance and we'd like to get back to it. So you're stressed about something coming up, you're going to do some work to prepare for it. Maybe there's an upcoming exam and you're going to practice questions and study so that you are more prepared for that event. So you can make these responses. Um, I will state though that even though it's not explicitly put here, these stress responses are not always going to be beneficial. Some of them can be maladaptive, especially if we start looking at some of our frameworks and if we are overly stressed about something, maybe we've misframed it, uh, then it can actually lead to more of a panicked, not useful response, but more on that to come. 
Now, obviously, when we're thinking about stress, there's all sorts of different degrees, whether we're looking at sort of the duration of the stressor. So we can look at things that are sort of instantaneously stressful, but then immediately gone. Uh, maybe uh, on your drive to campus, you encounter uh, construction or something like that. And all of a sudden, you're now late. You are going to be on time for something, but because of construction or traffic or something, you've ended up detoured and are now running late. So you are stressed in the moment, but once you arrive at your destination, whether you're early or late, you're kind of done with the event. So that's something fairly short term. But we can also have longer term events, things that are going to affect us for long periods of time. So chronic stressors. And we can vary in intensity. You can have stuff that's really extreme or sort of a mild inconvenience. And the cumulative effects of multiple of these different types of stressors can have both short-term and long-term effects on our physical health, our behavior, and all sorts of things. So this is a very broad topic. And to start with sort of what can we talk about, what can we frame in terms of describing these uh, things that make us stressed, uh, stressful events are something really important to consider. And anytime you start talking about events that cause stress, um, you usually end up going back to some original work by Holmes and Rahe, who were working in the 60s and have had their work updated and added to as the years have gone on. But they were some of the first to describe the fact that major life changes can end up causing sort of both positive and negative stress in our lives. Um, so these events might be good things. So I usually use the examples of people getting married. Uh, weddings are supposed to be a happy time, and it's something that people are looking forward to. But the act of getting married can itself be stressful. So you don't frame it as sort of a negative, bad form of stress because you're hopeful towards the future, but it still has an effect on our well-being and on what's going on inside of our lives. So we start considering the fact that you can have both good and bad stress, which will continue coming up in a couple of slides. But looking at all these different uh, life events and the fact that we can have positive and negative events that are all going to vary in degree of intensity, um, we kind of want to start quantifying them. And that's where this work by uh, Holmes and Rahe comes in, where they actually put together a list of events and ranked them according to sort of relative contributions to stress, where more extreme events are going to have higher scores and less extreme events will have lower scores. So in those cases, you can kind of look at an individual, and if you were doing a survey, you could say in the last 10 years or across your lifetime, have you encountered any of these situations? And the more things that they say yes to, we'd say they have higher cumulative rates of stress than if they said yes to fewer things. So higher scores end up actually correlating with higher rates of illness. Um, I do have one thing where within the slides uh, from the textbook, they like to make a statement that high rates of stress cause illness. But of course, we don't like to talk about causal relationships. We talk about the fact that the two things correlate with one another. So higher rates of stress correlate with higher rates of illness. And while yes, the stress might be part of the instigation of that development of illness, and we'll talk about some of those physical pathways on how you get to that point later on, but we don't know that it's the stress itself that's directly causing the illness. There's also many, many other factors to consider. This is a complex situation. So I keep changing it to correlates to higher rates of illness rather than going with a causal route. So we also then want to consider things like those positive events, even though they are stressful, tend to have less of an impact. They tend to cause less bad side effects. But you can also look at things like if you look forward to something or if there's some uh, joyful component to it, that can actually counteract some of that stress as well. And then just for an example, not that you need to know any of these things, but uh, it's just showing a couple of the different things that would make this inventory of different stress uh, events. So we could look at things like, oh, you moved. That's something that's mildly stressful. We're in that 20 range where something very, very stressful, like say the death of a partner, would be in the 100 range. 
And these scores get updated and the lists added to as time goes on, just because our lives change, uh, things that we encounter change. So this is something that definitely gets adapted. And you can see at the bottom here, this was adapted from the original work by Holmes and Rahe, but it has been updated. Um, and yeah, clearly you can tell it's just sort of borrowed from one of the inventories being implemented. Um, hence all the fonts being a little bit funky. And so for all of those events, we can call them life events because they are showing us changes in our life, events that are leading to these broad changes. And they're just sort of any substantial alteration to how we're living our lives. And usually it's the fact that this is requiring change to our behavior and we have to make adjustments to how we're living. So uh, say uh, moving, you now have to be in a new environment. You now have to change up your routine, getting to work things like that. So change tends to be stressful for us, but again, there can be good and bad aspects to that change. Which brings us to another famous figure in uh, the stress research, which is Hans Selye, um, who is sometimes called the father of stress research. They like to name people based on, you know, this is our source of these uh, ideas to start. Um, but regardless, um, we have a quote from him that says, stress is unavoidable, and in fact, it would be undesirable to avoid it. I have often said that stress is the spice of life, and it can make, uh, or it can be a great stimulus to achievement. So Selai here is saying that stress is something that can be motivating, something that can sort of push us to achieve and accomplish. And again, getting into that stress could be good or bad. Um, and might actually give us benefits in our lives. And as usual, it's, it can be beneficial in moderation, but it completely depends on the source, as well as things like how you interpret that stress, because that will dramatically influence our reaction. So if we're talking good and bad stress, of course, we have a proper term for it. You stress is what we would call our good stress. So this is, they all start the same for the definition. So including internal or sorry, external circumstances, internal emotional experiences and bodily or physiological responses. All of that is just saying anything that's stress categorized, but these events need to be beneficial and motivating. So maybe you have an upcoming test, but you're pretty confident that you understand this class. You're pretty good in these topics. And so you're viewing this test as a chance to show off your abilities. You're gonna show your knowledge and you're gonna further your education. So you can frame that through this you stress lens of something that's going to be a challenge to you, but not necessarily a bad thing. And then of course, in contrast, distress is bad stress. That would be what most of our discussions of stress, we would assume fall under this type of a definition. So the same thing, it can be internal, external, physiological, all of it's included, but these responses that are sort of negative, they're harmful, they reduce our motivation, they impair functioning. So maybe you have a test coming up in a class and you're confused, you don't understand anything in that class, and it's a lot, it's too much. And you maybe sit there thinking, there's no way I can study for all of this before the test, that would be a bad thing, that would be distressing. And that might mean that rather than trying to study and prepare for that stressful upcoming event, maybe you don't bother. You're going to have impaired functioning. You're not motivated to try because of how you frame the situation. So we'll get into that framing momentarily, but I also do want to give a label to one other concept we've been talking about, which is the fact that we can have different dura uh, durations and severities of our stressors when we were looking at our inventory, we saw different severities, so more stressful versus less stressful from top to bottom, um, but we can also look at the duration. So there's a bunch of different ways to break these down. Usually the agreed upon ones are acute versus chronic stressors. Acute just meaning that it's something short term, uh, chronic meaning that it's something longer term. And then it goes a little bit off the rails depending on the source you look at. Traumatic stressors are occasionally brought out as sort of a separate third category. And the reason for this is because while acute and chronic stressors are sort of just describing long-term versus short-term things in your day-to-day -day life, traumatic stressors are ones that are in the extremes in terms of magnitude of stress. 
So these would be extreme things that are usually tied to threat to your own or another's life. So these have uh, almost like a special category for them just because of that massive increase in sort of physical risk associated. But I always give the disclaimer that it's not always included as something separate and might just be on the extreme end of the scale for acute stressors if it was something like, uh, say, somebody is mugged. Um, that might be an acute stressor, an extreme acute stressor, if we didn't have a separate category for traumatic events. So just a little bit of a disclaimer there. Um, and then usually if we're talking sort of acute versus chronic, short versus long term, how do we divide them up? As always, it depends. Usually acute, we're just saying that it's something fairly brief. Um, and then we use minutes to hours as our quantifiers, just in case we needed something um, to sort of decide on that. Uh, chronic stressors, we're going to say weeks to years. Um, and then, of course, there's sort of that in-between of like, what if something's a couple of days? And it depends on who you ask. But if I was talking about the fact that we have an upcoming exam, um, and then once the exam's done, we can go back to not being stressed, I'd still cat categorize that as acute. Chronic is going to be something that it's lasting for really long periods of time, and it's usually going to involve things that are repetitive. Um, and so these continuous ongoing stressors, we call them chronic because they're continuing to happen over those long periods. And these are often going to be linked to things like, say, social relationships. This could also be related to something like job stressors, because you're going to work your job for years and years. Um, and even if the day-to-day -day chronic stress is very small, maybe it's you're at a job and you have a coworker that's mildly irritating. But if you work with that person for, say, 20 years, those events of irritation can add up. So we can find this accumulation of effects. And once those effects are starting to take effect, they can be fairly long-lasting. So it's kind of interesting to see that acute stressors might be, say, intense in the short term, but then quickly gone. That might not be as detrimental as something long term and repetitive that in any one event looks small and unimpactful, um, but is actually very, uh, very impactful. So it's all about magnitude and duration and that cumulative effect because it's going to build up. And then just a couple of examples here. So acute versus chronic versus traumatic, as always borrowed from one of my textbooks, though not ours. Um, and then here we'd say, so the acute is a couple minutes to a couple days, something like getting stuck in traffic. Chronic is going to be weeks to years. So this could be, say, you have a long-term illness, a chronic illness, or a partner does. Um, traumatic then, again, being that immediate threat to physical integrity, that would be looking at things like natural disasters. Um, and there's an entire field of psychology related to things like how people react to these extreme scenarios. And again, that's why this is sometimes separated out as its own separate category for study. And then, of course, one more of these concepts that I've been referring to, talking about how we frame or perceive different events, how we interpret stressful situations, there's actually, of course, a model for that. And this is going to be looking at threats versus challenges, where we can ask questions about, you know, what is it, the event that I'm stressing about? What is the stressor? How am I going to interpret that? But then we also want to think about how prepared am I for that? So it's not just this threat, or not, sorry, not the threat. I can't use that term because it's going to be important later with its own definition. But the situation, we'll stick with our exam um, because I've already been using it. So we have an exam coming up. And we're going to evaluate what we need to do about that exam. I'm going to do some hopping between slides here because I have the definition here. So first off, a prim primary appraisal when we encounter some potentially stressful event, we're going to look at it. We're going to have our perception of the characteristics of that stressor, the magnitude of the demand, basically what is it going to require of us, and relevance. This is something kind of important because if there's a stressful event coming up, but we don't really care about it because it's not important. So maybe there's a class and there's an upcoming exam, but it's not a class that counts for anything. Maybe it's not going to add towards your final grade, something like that. 
in those cases, you don't really care about the qualities of that particular stressor because it doesn't matter. So that's why we include relevance. But for the others, the magnitude of demand is going to be how much do we need to put into this? So for an upcoming test, how much would you need to study? Um, how much knowledge do you not have available? Um, stressor characteristics, it's what do you need to do for this exam? So preparing and being able to sit in the room and answer these questions, you're starting to consider the characteristics of that specific event. But then, of course, once we've decided what is it that needs to happen, we evaluate our own resources that are available to deal with that stressor. So that's our secondary appraisal, where we basically say, again, focused on our own perceptions, um, what resources do we have that we could use to cope with that situation? And this is, again, something that can be internal or external. Uh, external could be something like, maybe you have a friend who's able to help you study. Maybe you, have, um, a, a, you can pay a tutor in order to help. Do you have the financial resources available? We also have internal factors, though. And this can be things like your personality or your abilities. Have you already been doing really well in this class? Do you already have a lot of knowledge built up? In those cases, you're saying, yeah, I have lots of resources here to help me. And then the idea of, is it a threat or is it a demand? It's um, evaluating, or sorry, is it a threat or is it a demand? Uh, we're going to look at the demands and our resources and decide, is it a challenge or a threat? That's what I meant to say. And here, challenges are going to be something that we are almost ready for, something that we are fairly sure that we have resources in access to those demands. So from my primary appraisal, we know the magnitude of demand, how much I need to be able to do to successfully meet this uh, event. And our secondary appraisal says, I have time to do that. I have the knowledge to do that. I have the people to help me get there. So I'm going to frame this as a situation that is a challenge. So we have this potential for more positive outcomes. Um, we're actually thinking that this is something I'm capable of handling and I'm excited for it, something that might challenge me and push me and motivate me, like Celi might have uh, focused on, um, but we're definitely focusing on this as a good thing. And in our framework, if getting a good grade in this class is something important for us and it's going to help us with our degrees, that thing that, oh, yeah, so I'm getting something good out of it can be even more positive in our minds. It can kind of skew us to be more optimistic about those outcomes, and it leads us a little bit more likely to call something a challenge. Uh, in contrast with threats, these are going to be the opposite, where the demands of this upcoming stressor ends up exceeding the resources that you have available for coping. Um, and again, we can have some biases here where if we overweight the demand, things that are maybe dangerous or uncontrollable, those are going to be sort of hyped up in our minds as more demanding. And we then lead, uh, or it may lead us to be more likely to think that we can't actually succeed in this. We have too many demands and not enough resources. Maybe you have way too much to study and no time to do it. So you're more likely to view that situation, our exam in this case, as a threat. And as you can probably tell from the wording, the same situation could be framed as either a challenge or a threat, depending on the individual. So each person will have their own evaluation. They're going to decide, all right, is this uh, too much, not enough? Um, based on what they're thinking in the moment. And of course, you can probably imagine that your internal state at the time can dramatically affect this framework. So if we look at somebody who, say, uh, is pessimistic, um, with our personality traits, pessimism is a pretty strong one. Um, so pessimistic individuals will be more likely to overestimate the demand of an event and probably underestimate their own resources available. That very negative thought pattern will lead them to be more threatened rather than challenged by stressful scenarios. So things like that are really, really important. And then another term that kind of relates to that concept of demands is the idea of pressure. So you'll occasionally see this used in the literature instead, but pressure is just when we have these expectations or demands uh, that we should behave in a certain way. So if we talk about the, a time crunch, time pressure says that this all needs to happen by a deadline. 
knowing that you have an exam in say a week is a lot less stressful than knowing that you have one in a day or in a couple of hours. So it's really important to keep in mind that time crunch. Uh, pressure to conform might be things like, okay, I would act this way, but I'm in a group setting, so now I'm being pushed to conform to this situation. Um, that's something that we can stress about. And we can also have some, uh, uh, I guess, evaluations of, are we already good at blending in and conforming with this group? Or is it something we're stressed about because maybe we don't match this group very well? Uh, and then, of course, performance pressure is usually what we're thinking about when we start looking at this model, this model here, sort of succeeding of, uh, in a particular task. But you can apply a lot of these models in a lot of different circumstances. So these are just saying, here's some places that pressure might come from. Um, and it can be ourselves putting this pressure on us. So maybe you have your own deadline. I want to have studied everything by this date, but it might also be an external source. So you don't set the exam date, the instructors and the university do. Um, so that's something outside of yourself. And that ties us really, really nicely to the idea of perceived control, which we've actually talked about before. Now, we talked about this earlier in terms of sort of personality and how we think our actions can influence our day-to-day -day life. So remember talking about internal versus external locus of control. And obviously that's gonna apply really nicely to stress as well, because your feelings of control can actually influence how much you evaluate your resources. Can I handle this situation? So, of course, having an internal locus of control, we feel like our own actions can actually influence a situation. And logically, if we feel like our actions matter, we're probably going to feel better about an upcoming stressful situation. So this, if we stick with the studying example, because it's still nice and easy. So I have a feeling that studying is actually going to improve my performance. I'm fairly confident that I can study and learn and acquire this information to be prepared. So I'm gonna be more likely to frame this situation as a challenge rather than a threat. With an external locus of control though, this is where we think that external forces influence a situation and our actions don't really matter. And if we feel like you have no control in a situation, you're more likely to frame things as threats. This is going to be a sort of greater perceived stress because you don't feel like you can take action in order to make changes in order to improve that situation. And then one more uh, theory here, or one more model to talk about before we move on to different reactions to stress, um, but this is looking at internal conflict as described by Lewin. And this is a really old uh, model. This is from back in the 30s. And again, has been updated and modified as time goes on. But this originally started with Lewin in 1935, um, where he described three basic types of conflict. And in these cases, conflicts are gonna be situations where we have two or more incompatible motivations or behavioral impulses, things that we could do, and we have to choose between the two. So this is all about, you've encountered a scenario, maybe you have limited abilities or limited resources, and you have to choose where to direct your behaviors. So each of these is talking about types of conflict, the first being approach, approach. And this is when you have to choose between two good and attractive goals. So this would be something like you go to a restaurant and on the menu, there are multiple really good options. And so you need to pick the best of the good things. Obviously, because you're choosing between two good things, the outcome is always going to be good. So in this case, it's pretty non-stressful. It's always going to be a good outcome. So you're not stressed about making that decision. So that kind of a conflict is pretty easy to resolve and a lot less problematic. Um, but then we get into our avoidance avoidance, which is going to be the opposite. And this is when you're choosing between two unattractive goals. This is one of those where you have to pick the lesser of two evils. Which of these two bad options is the least bad? So this could be something like uh, maybe you're choosing between undergoing a surgery or dealing with the health problems of not getting the surgery. 
Uh, maybe you have to choose between uh, having no money versus working at a not so great job. In this case, it's always going to be a bad outcome. And therefore, this is going to be the most stressful of our conflict situations. And then the last one is approach avoidance. And so in this, uh, in this case, um, we're looking at a situation where you're choosing if you want to pursue a single goal with both attractive and unattractive aspects. So in this case, our choice is not between option A and option B. Here, our choice is, do I want to do this thing or not? So yes or no, but we need to evaluate the fact that there are both good and bad consequences of choosing this thing. So this could be something like um, asking somebody new out on a date, knowing that they might either accept or reject. So you have that potential positive and potential uh, negative. Could also be something like investing. So you want to put money into a new investment portfolio and you have the potential of making money if it goes well, or there's a risk of losing money, which might mean that you don't get anything good out of it. So we need to start weighing the pros and cons and decide if it's worth choosing this one choice of action. Um, and then of course, because with some of these, we're trying to evaluate sort of the good and the bad, um, what is the best of our options, we'll occasionally see something called vacillation, um, which is just a back and forth uh, indecisiveness. So you can kind of think of it like something similar in terms, oscillation, where you're going to move from one side to the other. Here with the vacillation, we're oscillating, we're bouncing back and forth on a decision. And it might just be that, okay, I thought that this would be sort of more good than bad, but now that I've thought more about it, I'm seeing more bad than good. So I'm gonna change my choice until I'm forced to make that decision. Um, and also in that situation, that waiting for a choice to happen um, can itself be stressful. And sometimes not having a long period of time in which to make your decision can actually be better in the long term. So being forced to make a quick decision might be a little bit easier. And if we go back to our approach approach example with picking from multiple good options on a menu, sometimes having the waiter or waitress come back really quickly and say, hey, um, what is it that you're ordering? Um, you might just make a gut choice and then it's out of your hands and then you can relax. Um, so just interesting to consider.